We're going to get started, okay? we got a couple other people coming in, I think. Uh, so welcome again to uh, our monthly education session. Uh, remember, remember, or is period? Stop it. Uh, we have a new internship, so to speak. First, Tom Kleepat is her professor. He's going to be introducing her. And this is Hallie. Right? Mm -hmm. She's our So it, it's, uh, she's involved in, or wants to go to physical therapy school, I believe. So, and that's why we're having Over. Hi, uh, I am a faculty in the biology department. I teach uh, a lot of classes that are of interest to people going into the <coughs> health profession. But um, I have had a particular interest at this school in students who aren't just the, the other the wide array of other health professionals. And I have been putting a lot of energy into uh, developing different relationships, one that's been going on for a long time, uh, related to nurse practitioners and assistants. Um, but I was really excited. I was really excited uh, this summer, uh, or actually I guess it was in the spring, it was in the spring, when uh, Hallie uh, had contacted me. She was a former student who had taken a human physiology class, um, I don't know, years ago, I guess. Sophomore year. Yeah, her sophomore year. And it's just excellent, very serious, focused student. Uh, had reached out to me, had already been in contact uh, with Westy here. And uh, had this idea for, uh, um, Hallie herself is a neuroscience uh, major in the biology department. Uh, she will tell you a little bit about herself more, but her interest has was originally on uh, chronic injury and maintenance of that, remediation of that, but then got interested in acute uh, uh, care and, and had really, uh, it was the two of you that cooked up this, this in, internship, really, I, I just was fortunate enough to uh, stumble into it. But, yeah, she'll, she'll describe it. Uh, her hope is to, to go on into athletic training. Or, and so, yeah, I'll, I'll let her talk more about that. The, the, before I sit down, the hope is that this becomes an ongoing relationship between Colby students that are interested in this, these potential careers. Uh, the different trainers that are out there too, and this amazing community, it's really something. <coughs> Sit down. So as Tom mentioned, um, I came up with this independent study with Westy um, throughout the fall. And it's sort of accumulated in this research for correlation between low back pain and pelvic tilt. Um, I don't declare any conflict of interest to the school. Um, and so a little about, about me first. Um, as Tom mentioned, I'm a senior here at Colby, not a graduate student. Um, I'm a biology major, and I've had interest in physical therapy for a couple of years. Um, before Colby, I wasn't quite sure that I would ever want to be in a medical profession. Um, but since coming here, that's sort of grown every year with the bio classes I've gotten to take. Um, and I have a bit of personal history. I've been playing sports since I was very young, and I've been an ice hockey goalie for 12, 13 years. This resulted in me having a pretty serious lower body injury my senior year of high school. I had this MRI done. Um, my senior year in high school, just before I was 18, 
I had torn my labrum pretty severely and it resulted in a femoral acetabular impingement. I calcified a lot of bone on the head of my femur and in the socket of my femur to the point where I was unable to finish my season. Um, and I had surgery that February and missed out my senior softball season and the recovery process. But that process sort of opened my eyes to the applications of physical therapy and I got really interested in my treatment process. And I sort of started asking my therapist a lot of questions about like why this was helping, what I should do to be preventative in the future. And that kind of snowballed into me being really interested in physical therapy here at Colby. And now I'm currently ap applying to physical therapy graduate programs. I'm sort of crossing my fingers. <laughs> um, but that sort of led me into this independent study my senior year, wanting to take an opportunity to use credit hours for something that I was really interested in looking at rather than the class. Um, and so with Westy and with Tom, I got in contact with some staff at Maine General and came up with the idea for this independent study. Um, I worked with Emily Staples at Waterville Senior High School, where I shadowed twice a week throughout the semester. Um, not hands-on at all, but just observing her care um, for patients who are, at the students, who are either recovering from some kind of surgery or injury or patients who are being preventative in their treatment, mostly predominantly acute care. Um, and I also accompanied her to quite a few sporting events, games and such um, at the school and then a little bit off campus. So my interest in this research wasn't exactly anything I observed, but based on my prior history and sort of the opportunity to look more closely at acute care, I've been looking at the correlation with low back pain and the structural development pelvis um, and sort of taking that opportunity to really dive really deep in this research um, and I found that low back pain is the fifth most common reason for a physician visit it's the second most common symptomatic reason so I think getting to explore what kind of sources are causing low back pain beyond just issues in the back itself are important um, for clinicians to be able to look at a patient who has low back pain maybe consider that just treating the back isn't going to be lasting um, reduction. And so a little bit on the anatomy of what I was looking at specifically um, has to do with the position of the pelvis and its position with the spine. Um, a neutral pelvic posture is very vertical, you know, knees, hips, shoulders all in line, all facing forward. Two conditions that I really looked at in this research that sort of helped me look at what is causing back pain is the anterior and the posterior pelvic tilt. Um, the anterior pelvic tilt, the tilt is kind of forwards towards the ground. It sort of increases the lordotic curve in the back. It's usually caused by weakness or shortness of sort of the anterior muscles in the leg, the quadriceps, um, while the posterior pelvic tilt is a backwards tilt of the pelvis, and this results in a more flat back syndrome where the curve disappears from the spine. <clears throat> and this is sort of a result of shortness and weakness in sort of the posterior muscles and hamstring. Um, <clears throat> so I looked at quite a bit of research trying to see what the correlation between pelvic tilt and low back pain was. And my initial findings, um, sort of came up in this paper, which looked at anterior tilt specifically, um, which seems to be a more common um, diagnosis. This paper looked at about 100 patients who all um, had some amount of back pain. Those who had a VAS score of seven or higher um, were considered the pained group, and those under were considered relatively healthy. <clears throat> These healthy individuals were scored among male and females, with females having a slightly higher average tilt. Um, and they wanted to test and see if the measurement of anterior tilt would be higher among those patients who had a VAS score of seven. Um, and these are the results that they found, um, that females more so than males continued to have a more pronounced anterior tilt, and that among those with pain, there was a correlation in pain with the um, pelvic tilt. They found that the VAS score um, was only correlated in females, which the researchers sort of 
credited to the female anatomy being a little bit more swayed to anterior tilt to begin with, just with how the pelvis needs to be situated to account for pregnancy. Um, and they also associated the pelvic tilt with causing back pain in part to a more pronounced lordotic in the back. They didn't test this correlation, it's just what they started to hypothesize. Um, and they followed up this experiment with a muscular test. They tested half of the pained group with a lower body exercise and half with a trunk exercise to see if they could reduce the pain in those, pa in those patients. Only the group that did lower body exercise had any reduction in pain. None of the trunk groups strengthening their abdominal muscles had any reduction in their back. So this kind of continued into me looking at, well, is lordosis going to be a cause or is pelvic tilt going to be a cause of back? And this next paper did look at that a little bit more specifically, pelvic tilt and lumbar lordosis. Um, they took um, topographic imaging and they compared quite a few different measurements trying to see if pelvic inclination or pelvic tilt and lordosis would be correlated. <clears throat> um, and they did before and after angle measurements. They didn't test for pain, so I'm a little uncertain how exaggerated some of these patients' conditions were. Um, but they found between these two angle measurements that there was a correlation between strengthening exercise and the reduction of the condition in pelvic tilt. But with the same strengthening regimen, there was no reduction in the lordotic angle. <clears throat> so this kind of goes in with the previous study, which is saying that these two treatments are a little bit individualistic. They need to be source specific in order for whatever condition is causing the pain to actually be getting any sort of benefit. This next paper looked at sort of all three of these things together, pelvic tilt, lordosis, back pain, as well as a disability scoring. Um, they used the Oswestry Pain Disability Index questionnaire, um, which the researchers um, quantified themselves. Um, and they wanted to see whether low back pain and pelvic tilt were correlated with this disability scoring. <clears throat> and they did this based on known correlations between lordotis angle and pelvic tilt, as we've kind of seen. Both are appearing in patients who have back pain, but it's a little uncertain what if there is a dependence on both or one. So they used, again, the VAS um, visual analog scale and the visual measurements of the pelvic angle and lordosis. And they found a number of conclusions, um, which I think are pretty important, one of which was that the low back pain subjects did have a significantly higher pelvic tilt angle than those with healthy backs among both men and women. Um, secondly, among those with pelvic tilt, there wasn't a correlation with disability, and this is because the disability scoring among those who recorded back pain and those who did not record back pain were nearly identical. So as many people who had back pain as those who didn't were scoring as having a disability. And these results kind of raised a few questions for the researchers. They remained a little inconclusive about causation and correlation. They kind of came down to two different theories, both having to do with posture, one was that patients who have low back pain are changing their posture on purpose, making their pelvic tilt more pronounced, and this is causing disability because it's misaligning their bodies. The second theory was that those who had a postural misalignment to begin with are just simply more at risk of having an increasing amount of back pain. So these sort of conclusions from this research has sort of led me to like narrow down the biomechanics of the problem and really look at sort of what is the anatomy that needs to be the focus of treatment for these conditions. And most importantly, the researchers seem all to be concluding that there are a number of muscles, particularly in the lower body rather than in the torso, associated with helping these conditions. So rather than focusing on abdominal muscles or sort of lower back muscles to correct posture, it seems like targeting these lower muscle groups are the best way to target pelvic tilt, which seems to be the conclusion of what's causing a serious amount of back pain in patients. So these groups are the, like the psoas, the adductor group, they're the hamstring group, the gluteus, um, the tensor fascia lata. Um, they sort of theorize that having these muscles strengthened, dependent on what the condition of the pelvis is, 
will result directly in the reduction of um, so I wanted to look at a number of what these treatments are, sort of based on what they're suggesting. Um, the first is resistance-based strengthening exercise, sort of what you would associate with typical athletic training or physical therapy, and my personal experience. Um, the second is kinesio taping, followed by corrective gait and sort of postural manipulation, and then potential surgery procedure. Um, so the strengthening exercise was an investigation of individual resistant therapy on lower back pain, pelvic tilt, and lordotic curve. These are patients who had posterior pelvic tilt and a VAS score of six, so nearly as severe as that first patient. Um, these patients were all scored initially in an assessment as having their pain reduced when their anterior pelvic tilt was increased. So the researchers sort of modified a certain number of exercise, um, exercises that they hoped daily strengthening repetitions would induce the anterior pelvic tilt and would reduce their posterior tilt, and that this should reduce the pain of patients. And so these three um, exercises that they did were modified deadlifts, they were hamstring curls, and so is isolation, um, all of which target sort of those muscles that keep the pelvis sort of in its correct position. Um, they found, like I mentioned, um, that the pain influenced the exercises that they were using. While they were exercising, the pain was reduced because this sort of anterior tilt position was usually in place during the exercise. Um, and they found that the pain decreased at the conclusion of the experiment during the final assessment among the patients, and anterior pelvic tilt and lumbar curve had both increased. So from the prior initial assessment where there was posterior tilt, <clears throat> these angles had sort of returned to what a normal range was considered. And the result of this sort of suggests that individual resistance, strengthening, and stretching exercises should be the most productive sort of mode of treatment for the pelvic tilt muscles. Another experiment that I looked at wanted to see whether a motor control experiment or a stretching experiment would be more productive um, in reducing back pain and anterior pelvic tilt. Um, the two figures here most significant are sort of to the top left and the bottom right showing anterior tilt and back pain. Among the two groups, it was found that the motor control group significantly reduced anterior pelvic tilt and it significantly reduced lower back pain patients. While the stretching group had relatively no difference. Um, the researchers suggested that this was because even though the motor exercise is targeting abdominal muscles, when these muscles are weakened, it sort of causes compensatory pelvic muscles to be engaged <coughs> that shouldn't typically be used um, to keep the pelvis <laughs> stabilized. Usually it would be larger muscles like in the adductors and in the hamstrings, but this is sort of engaging minor abdominal and sort of like gluteus muscles, and these muscles continue to weaken the lower body. So they believed that by engaging abdominal strength, they could sort of correct the posture, and it established further that resistance treatment would aid the pain and these postural. Um, next, I wanted to look at kinesio taping, which is particularly popular among athletes. Um, and this research was on a case study of a young swimmer, a collegiate swimmer, who had anterior pelvic tilt and lower back pain. And the researchers wanted to see if cutaneous cues would be enough to correct her poor posture and to reduce the pain she was feeling in her back. And they theorized this based on the fact that she was fit to begin with and all of her muscles seemed to be in capable working order. So they wanted to see if, if cueing her posture would have been enough to sort of correct the misalignment in her pelvis and in her back. So over a one month period, this is sort of the taping method that they used. They anchored at the rectus abdominis and um, along the core sort of taped up to her chest. And then along the right side, they taped across from the rectus abdominis to the middle of the spine, sort of over the top of the hip. And again, sort of higher into the back under the lats. Um, they only did this taping method on the right-hand side because there was an imbalance in the tilt of her pelvis to one side rather than the other, which you'll see in the results in a moment. The results of this taping um, 
under about eight different movement tests that they had her run through, every single one started as positive or present in causing pain. Her VAS score of eight reduced to a zero, and every one of these eight movements no longer caused pain at the end of the trial. And her anterior pelvic tilt decreased both on the right and left side, which you can see has a bit of a tilt towards the left. Both reduced down to nearly 10 degrees. Um, and both the Cobb's angle and the sacral horizontal angle, which were in hyperlordosis, both decreased. And this Cobb's angle here is what sort of becomes a little bit more interesting later on in some of these treatment methods. It's associated with the S1 to L5 region of the spine, um, and it's associated with sort of this sacral horizontal, um, how vertical, how horizontal it ends up tilting. Um, yeah. On all oh, the time, that's number of days, I believe. They did 12 days um, with taping and then 12 days followed without tape, or without taping and then with taping. So I think that they're just overlaid with each other. Um, and so the researchers ended up coming to the conclusion that these core muscles, this rectus abdominis cueing, did have a hand in correcting the posture of the patient because she didn't need any particular strengthening, simply cueing these core muscles associated with keeping the spine in its correct posture was enough to significantly reduce her, her um, pain as well as her inter tilt. And the next um, sort of treatment method I looked at was gait manipulation. This was using the functional readaptive exercise device, also called FRED. Um, this device has been used in aerospace programs to help astronauts reacclimate to Earth's gravity, um, considering that a lot of astronauts have a lot of joint and postural problems returning from zero gravity. This device sort of retrains their muscles to be cued to handle sort of regular walking, and it helps sort of keep their body in the correct alignment. And these researchers, researchers wanted to test whether there was a connection between spinal mechanics and the lower back pain being produced. Um, they want to see if muscle-specific conditioning in these muscles that sort of the last paper indicated should have hand in these postural developments, specifically the transverse abdominis and the multifidi, um, could be conditioned to correct the posture of the patients and reduce their pain. Um, and these patients all had postural problems, not all of them had back pain. So this sort of divided them among a walking regimen and among a FRED regimen with mixed healthy patients and painful pained patients. And they found among every patient that the FRED was more um, productive in correcting their posture. Among those who had pain and who did not have back pain, um, the spinal extension in their backs increased specifically at that Cobb's angle, um, which is associated with sort of the lordosis curve. Um, and in both the pained and unpained group, their anterior pelvic tilt increased from their original posterior pelvic tilt inclination. Um, so the improvement between the lower back pain and the no pain group were nearly identical. There was no real difference among those that used FRED because both improved significantly. Um, and the results of this suggest that the cueing of muscles that sort of promote regular lumbar lordosis and pelvic tilt, regardless of the pain systems or the pain symptoms, can be sort of manipulated into using correct posture. And the last um, method that I wanted to look at was a surgery procedure. As someone who's had an invasive surgery, I sort of tend not to suggest that an invasive procedure should be sort of your primary method of treatment. Um, however, the researchers kind of laid out that this was done on young athletes that they considered capable of bouncing back from an invasive surgery. And it was for those who had been unresponsive to physical therapy strengthening and resistance treatment for about six months. So these were pelvic, um, posterior pelvic tilt patients who had serious low back pain. Um, all of them were young athletes. And these researchers wanted to see if lengthening the hamstrings, which shortened hamstrings are associated with posterior pelvic tilt, 
if lengthening these muscles would reduce their pain, it would increase their spinal flexion and hip flexion. So they went into a procedure where the semi-tendinosis and semi-membranosis were both cut and divided, overall resulting in a seven centimeter increase in length for the hamstring group. And the spine and hip flexion was considerably increased. The two top images are before the surgery, the two bottom in, um, images are post-surgery. So you can see that the legs are capable of fully extending. You can see that the spinal flexion seriously does increase. And the young athletes were quoted to have had significant reduction in their back pain. However, the effects short-term, even if they seem beneficial, the researchers really questioned the long-term benefit because as sort of the prior research has been pointing out, these muscles are still weak and their contraction ability is probably still lacking. And so there's been no serious permanent treatment done to these muscles rather than just lengthening them. The research kind of suggests like lengthening these muscles while capable of sort of reducing the pain won't have any lasting effects because there hasn't been any strengthening treatment. There hasn't been any sort of method done to actually produce any change in the capabilities of these hamstring muscles. So a quick review of what all these treatments and all these diagnoses are saying. Um, lower back pain is a consistent reason and symptom of patient visits. That makes understanding research about the lower back important and understanding what the sources of pain are is important. Um, and lower back pain is complicated because of its location in the spinal chain. Um, posture can directly influence lower back pain, whether it's the lordotic curve or whether it's a lower body issue. Um, and pelvic tilt and lordosis are both certainly independently correlated with lower back pain, but their relationship with each other is definitely a little bit more dependently driven. Um, targeting the correct source is definitely important for long-term lower back pain treatment. Based on these results, lordosis and pelvic tilt need a source-specific treatment. Targeting just one hasn't been enough to completely reduce or improve lower back pain. Um, and failing to treat lower back pain is associated with muscle atrophy and weakness and failed neuromuscular connection. And obviously these conditions can get as bad as conditions like sciatica and scoliosis. So really understanding what the sources of lower back pain are is really important to actually promoting good permanent treatment in the lower back. <clears throat> and the treatment should be individualistic, as I said, the tilt and lordosis can be extreme in two different directions. It can be either very flat or very curved. It can be very anterior or posterior. So understanding what needs to be stabilized, whether it's the spine or the pelvis, and in which direction should be very important in diagnosing the treatment. Um, and lower back pain is associated with that Cobb's angle, the L5 to S1 region. So understanding the muscles that are really associated with that part of the anatomy should definitely be a source of initial assessment, whether that's strengthening the psoas and the adductors or whether it's the hamstring group and the abdominals. This region is really important in maintaining correct posture. Um, and so targeting strengthening of those muscles should be an initial reason um, or an initial cause of treatment. Following that up, it seems that corrective postural cues in patients who do have good muscle capability and good motor control are enough to reduce back pain, whether that's kinesio taping or whether that is a device to correct posture, like a thread device. Um, and lastly, in patients who seem resistant to these treatments, surgery does seem to be a corrective method that can reduce back pain, which is sort of the immediate cause of concern for a patient. However, assessing that these muscles aren't necessarily going to be strengthened as a result of surgery that leaves sort of a need for further treatment and further sort of methods to keep that patient preventative because surgery will not be enough to sort of provide lasting. <laughs> sure. Yeah, Emily. I was, I, and it's not hard. Okay. Um, <laughs> it's more so you show that you sit down a couple times more. Do you find anywhere? 
whole thing? Or were they really trying to I didn't find any that were overlapped. <coughs> I think that's interesting. So I would like to find <laughs> some that are overlapped, but I didn't find any. Chris? What was the, you said young athlete. For like, like the hamstring yeah, one? What, like, what age was it? Um, age was they were as young as preteens. So they, the, at the oldest, they were like 18. Okay. So it was that. No, the the paper was published by um, a group of authors who all had, I believe, Japanese last names. So I don't know if it's very common in the U.S. It might have been sort of common in like a training facility elsewhere. Um, but I think the sample size was. It was referencing a specific case study, but they referenced the results, of, the results of about a dozen other young athletes, saying that it's used for other people commonly. What surprised you? About the research? Mm -hmm. Just in general. Um, I suppose for me what was surprising was that um, a device like Fred was enough to correct posture, because for me, I haven't been able to use a lot of conditioning equipment because it makes my back hurt more. So it's interesting to me that there's a device specifically used that corrects posture. That was surprising. Uh, it looked like that was some type of a problem. Yeah. Uh, I know we've used people recovering from ankle injury or knee injury in the back and they're running and using that. Mm -hmm. Is there anything unique about it? Other than just that lift pattern? The Fred um, device? Yeah. Um, I don't know that there was. I tried to see, just looking up more about the device, not from that paper, it, like what it was that it did mechanically. But the research, I mean, just sort of didn't seem. Here you could say, it yeah. Show. yeah. Right. It shows that little. Was it also the of how often or for how long? For that walking study? Right. Um, I think it was um, a daily like walking exercise. So like they had people who just walked on the regular ground, people who used Fred. I think it was like a couple hours <coughs> weekly of walking, mm -hmm. and they sort of measured them over several weeks. Um, I don't know at a time what the exercise was, but it was like a week measurement of an exercise that they all did. Um, for me, Fred is interesting because I worked in a rehab facility that was for stroke patients and patients with neurological disabilities. And so they have like a full device that sort of latches on to your legs and body and sort of makes you walk with a correct gait. So I've seen stuff like that, but I'd never seen something like this, which doesn't seem like it attaches directly onto the body. It's more of just following the correct steps. So I found that really interesting. You said that it was interesting to me. You said you had done a lift and found it uh, exacerbated your pain. Yeah. Do you find any evidence strengthening the anterior compartment and the posterior detriment, or is that not? Um, well, I think for me with ellipticals, it's easy to lean forward too far and just kind of fall out of what a running posture should be. Um, so for me, I think that's what it is. I just don't use the right posture when I'm running. I'm a hockey player, so I never learned how to run right um, to begin with. Um, so um, I think for me, that's what it is specifically. Um, but I think like for those patients who had posterior pelvic tilt using Fred, I think it's a matter of strengthening sort of those anterior muscles, like you mentioned the quadriceps, because the posterior muscles are too tight to begin with. That's why it's tilting posterior. So those muscles sort of need to be relaxed a little bit before they can be strengthened. And so I think maybe, but the research, I mean, for that one specifically didn't talk about strengthening. It was simply walking.
Awesome. Thank you.